in the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. During her time at the Commission, she's been involved in investigating and litigating consumer protection cases involving data security, privacy, work at home scams, and telemarketing fraud. Ms. Walker has the lead Ms. La, Ms. Walker was the lead attorney on the AshleyMadison.com investigation that was resolved when the company operated that the company that operated the website agreed to settle um, with the FTC. Um, and she also was part of the teams that litigated data security cases against Wyndham Hotels and smart home products. Prior to joining the FTC, Ms. Walker was a litigation associate at Fulbright and Jaworski LLP in Washington, D.C. While in private practice, she participated in attorney loan program where she served as a special assistant and was an attorney general for the D.C. office of the attorney general uh, for about seven months on loan. In that position, she represented the district in civil proceedings, including two jury trials. She began her career serving as a judicial law clerk to the Honorable Eric T. Washington of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Ms. Walker has received her JD from Cornell University, where she was a note ed editor in Cornell Journal of Law and Public Policy. She received her BA from the University of Miami. We welcome uh, to Shamika Walker and look forward to her presentation. And uh, we appreciate her giving her great expertise to us on this webinar today. Now, we also have returning, um, we had uh, Ms. Schifferly speaking last month as well, uh, and Ms. Schifferly was previously at the Federal Trade Commission. She's currently now at the CFPB, and she works as a senior policy analyst for the office, in the Office of Older Americans. Ms. Schifferly um, served as the FTC's Identity Theft Program Manager prior to coming here. At the FTC, she regularly presented on scams, identity theft, and cybersecurity. She also has litigated data security, privacy, and fraud cases. And before arriving at the FTC, she spent eight years at Merrick, Maryland's Legal Aid Bureau as a staff attorney and supervising attorney. She received her BA, summa cum laude, from Yale Youth College and her JD from the University of Virginia Law School. And we welcome Ms. Schifferly back and are so excited to have both of you as speakers today. And uh, I know that uh, the the participants will get a lot out of this presentation. I'm going to quickly run through my preliminary slides since we have two speakers so we can jump right in. First, our disclaimer. This presentation is being made by a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau representative on behalf of the Bureau. It does not constitute legal interpretation guidance or advice of the Bureau. Any opinions or views stated by the presenter are the presenter's own and may not represent the Bureau's views. The inclusion of links or references to third-party sites does not necessarily reflect the Bureau's endorsement of the third party. The views expressed on the third-party site or products or services offered on the third-party site. The Bureau has not vetted these third parties, their content, or any products or services they may offer. There may be other possible entities or resources that are not listed that may also serve your needs. And this document, of course, is being used as part of a presentation. So if you actually pass it on to someone later, we put a disclaimer in so they understand they may not get um, the full ideas that were meant to be expressed in just the presentation. And while I'm mentioning that, I want to remind everybody to please mute. If you're not already muted, you should have been automatically muted when you came in. But you can look uh, up your name on the participant list and check to see if you're muted. Secondly, I wanted to um, also let everyone know that if you are logged in and watching the slides, we will be sending you a copy of the deck so you don't have to write in for it. If um, for some reason you were unable to link to the slides and you're um, just uh, on the telephone um, you'll have, and you want a copy, please send an email to the uh, email address that's actually in the uh, chat, but I'll also tell you that you may not be looking at it. It's CFPB underscore FINEX, F-I-N-E-X, at CFPB.gov. I also wanted to just mention the mission of the Bureau. Many of you are probably already aware, but the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau regulates the offering and provision of consumer financial products and services under the federal consumer financial laws. We educate and empower consumers to make better informed financial decisions. Um, I'm just reminding people that we do have a very active coronavirus pandemic webpage, which is linked to many, many resources and other federal sites um, as well, such as the CDC 
and HUD, so it could easily be a one-stop place for you to gather information not only on protecting your finances, but also other issues related to coronavirus. Um, this web page um, represents a landing page you'll see when you come to the adult education page. I want to let everyone know that, um, ignore the, the link at the bottom for now, um, we're actually going through some revisions and refresh of our web page, which will make it uh, more user-friendly for you, our audience, and hopefully you'll be able to navigate more quickly and find what you're looking for. Um, but I did put the link to the new page in the actual uh, chat as well. So, um, but just if you, for those that are used to navigating, now you go to consumer education link first when you land on the main page, then you go to educator tools overview, and then to adult financial education. But the link is also in the chat um, as well for those of you that you know, hopefully many of you have already found your way there. Okay, um, and with that, uh, we've kind of covered the links that I've talked about there. We're gonna move forward and hear from our keynote speaker for today, um, Shaniqua Walker on identity theft. And after she speaks, then we will hear from our second keynote, uh, Lisa Schifferly, who will speak on coronavirus scam. So, uh, Shamika, are you all set? Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining. Um, as Heather mentioned, my name is Shamika Walker, and I'll be talking to you about identity theft, um, specifically ways that you can teach your clients uh, to combat, combat identity theft. So I'll begin by discussing recent trends in identity theft, and then we'll go over tips to combat identity theft, which will include understanding identity theft, avoiding it, and then a, a brief overview of different types of identity theft. Um, we'll wrap up our discussion of identity theft by discussing advice um, for what you and your or your clients can do if you become a victim of identity theft, and I'll point you to some helpful resources. So let's get started. The Department of Justice released its most recent survey findings on identity theft in 2019. Um, according to the DOJ's Bureau of Justice Statistics, 26 million people in the U.S. were victims of identity theft in 2016. That's one out of every 10 people aged 16 and up. And the numbers were up from 17.6 million in 2014 when they last did the survey. You can also see that losses from identity theft are huge, um, $17.5 billion in 2016 alone. More recently at the FTC, where we take identity theft complaints, more than 650,000 people told us that they were identity theft victims last year in 2019. Last year, the Consumer Central Network took in over 3.2 million reports. Um, people filed more complaints about identity theft in all of its various, various forms than any other type of complaint. Uh, identity theft complaints accounted for uh, over 20% of all the reports. Notably, um, of people who reported their age, those aged 20 to 29 uh, reported losing money to fraud in 33% of, of reports filed with the FTC while people aged 70 to 79 reported losing money in 13% of their reports. Um, and people 80 and over reported it in just 11% of their reports. But when they did ex experience a loss, people aged 70 and older reported much higher median losses than any other group. In 2019, credit card fraud topped the list of identity theft reports. The FTC received more than 271,000 reports from people who said that their information was misused on an existing account or to open a new credit card account. So now let's take a look at what we've been seeing so far this year with respect to identity theft reports. This graph charts data as of September 30th or through September 30th of uh, 2020. So the year's almost over. And we'll have uh, new data for the, fourth, the last quarter soon, um, but these are the top seven complaint categories for 2020. And the categories include bank fraud, credit card fraud, employment or tax related fraud, government documents or benefits fraud, loan or lease fraud, other identity theft, and phone or utilities fraud. Every category is increasing compared to last year, but the most dramatic increase is with government documents or benefits fraud, which is the aqua colored line that you see here. Um, especially unemployment insurance benefits um, theft. In 
And as you can see, the line was pretty flat from 2016 to 2019, but then there was a huge spike this year. Uh, these dramatic increases with all of the different types of identity theft could very well be related to COVID the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, because since uh, January of this year until yesterday, December 16th, the FTC has received 39,395 identity theft reports that mention COVID, stimulus, or related terms in the identity theft subcategories of tax, unemployment and wage, uh, government benefits, and government documents. And we've seen an increase in tax identity theft reports, which is the red line, um, which appears to be driven by concerns about the economic impact payments that occurred uh, earlier this year or were given out earlier this year. And now that there appears, or there's, I guess, discussion uh, to be another round of stimulus checks coming to consumers, um, I'm sure the identity theft reports that relate to tax identity theft um, will spike again next quarter. And we've also seen um, over 150% increase in tax fraud reports when you compare the first two quarters of 2019 to the first two quarters of 2020 when people were filing reports. Um, we're still in the process of analyzing this data, but this dramatic increase in tax fraud reports uh, may be related to the fact that the IRS asked people report identity theft involving the economic impact payments as tax fraud. So for the third quarter, the number started to go down again, but that's likely because people were no longer receiving those payments. But as I just mentioned, you know, there are news reports that there may be another uh, stimulus check coming to consumers um, soon. So it's important uh, to share with your clients um, that identity theft can take many forms. It could be someone opening a credit card or utility account in your name, or someone using your information to get a loan or a job or medical care to, um, or to get a tax refund. The important thing to remember is that whatever form identity theft takes, the impact on victims can be substantial and it can lead to serious problems. Um, and if someone misuses your information um, or your client's information to get credit, you yourself might be denied credit, like a mortgage uh, for a house. Uh, you can be denied public benefits, like disability benefits, um, or someone else could use your social security number to work. You can be harassed by debt collectors for debts that aren't yours, and you can even be denied medical care or receive improper treatment. Um, identity theft is one of those crimes that start off, that might start off with, you know, the discovery that someone opened up a credit card account in, in your name, but then months later you learn that other accounts were opened or that information was misused for other purposes. So we've discussed trends in identity theft, but what exactly is identity theft? Um, generally speaking, identity theft is the misuse of another person's personal information to fraudulently obtain goods or services or hide from the government, law enforcement, or others who perform background checks. If someone steals your identity, there could be a tremendous impact in their life, as I highlighted in the last slide. So good old-fashioned identity theft includes like, you know, losing your wallet or having it stolen, um, and unfortunately, it doesn't have to necessarily be stolen by a stranger, um, family members or friends could also be the culprit. Thieves can also steal your identity by dumpster diving, you know, sifting through trash or discarded documents, um, or buying it from a computer, I mean, from, from a corrupt um, insider at a bank or hotel or um, anywhere you've done business. So some more the sophisticated ways thieves can um, gain access to your client's personal information is by skimming and shimming, uh, data breaches, and by phishing or imposter scams. I'll talk a little bit about uh, skimming and shimming um, in a moment, and after that, I'll briefly uh, discuss data breaches. Um, I'm not going to talk a ton about phishing and imposter scams because Lisa will cover that in, in her uh, presentation next, but I'll just say that phishing happens when you get an email or a text that seems to be from someone you know, um, ask you to click on a link and ask you to give a password or your bank account information or some other kind of sensitive information. And, you know, usually it's pressuring you to act fast or something or says something bad will happen if you don't. Um, and those imposter scams come in a 
many varieties, but they work in the same way, you know, a scammer's pretending to be someone you know or trust to convince you to send them money. So skimming is a process um, by which a thief places a device on a credit card reader. It's usually like at a gas pump at a gas station or an ATM. Um, and it in intercepts the magnetic strip information from your credit card. Um, this allows the thief to copy a customer's uh, credit card number and information and sell it or use it um, to purchase goods. Uh, bank cards with magnetic strips uh, can be used to create a credit card uh, with stolen information. And this slide depicts, you know, an uh, image of a hidden camera at an ATM machine. It helps illustrate why it's important to protect or cover your pin as you enter it on a keypad. As more convenience stores and gas stations um, accept the chip cards, um, which most of them should have by now, but there's still a few that are lagging behind, fewer, fewer of these uh, gas stations or um, stores are requiring customers to swipe their cards, and instead you have to insert your chip card. As a result, these have uh, become more creative, and that's where shimming comes in, and that's when uh, it's kind of like an updated version of skimming. It's a, proster, um, a process where fraudsters insert a shim into the card reader that allows them to copy the chip card information. So they can't use that information to create another chip card, but they can use it to make a magnetic chip card uh, to use online um, or at least retailers that have not upgraded uh, to the chip card. So to, in order to reduce the possibility um, of being a victim of identity theft via shimming, you should tell your clients to use credit cards as opposed to debit cards whenever pro uh, possible. And while it's less convenient, instead of using an ATM located outside um, of the bank or paying at the pump, go inside of the bank or store for your transaction. Your clients should also review those statements carefully and report anything suspicious as soon as they notice something. And like I mentioned a, a, a few moments ago, when they enter their pins and devices, they should cover the keypad. And finally, um, ask them to consider other payment methods that don't require the use of a card like Apple Pay or Android Pay. And unfortunately, data bit breaches are very common these days, and, and just another way uh, identity thieves can gain access to your client's information. If any of your clients have recently received a notice that said their personal information was exposed in a data breach, or if they entered, uh, um, if they um, learned that one of their uh, accounts were hacked online, direct them to identitytheft.gov slash data breach. This website provides steps for your clients to take to help protect and recover from identity theft. But, you know, there are some ways that your clients can can reduce their risk of identity theft. Um, and I'll go over those things um, briefly now. So the first thing is don't carry your social security card in your wallet or write your social security number down on a check or any kind of document. Um, and you should only give out your social security number if it's absolutely necessary. You can always ask for the person asking for it if there's another identifier that they can use instead of your social security number. You should shred all of your uh, financial documents and paperwork with personal information before you discard them. So don't just throw it in the trash. You need to shred it first. Don't give out personal information on the phone, through mail, or over the internet unless you're sure who you're dealing with. Also, never click on links um, in unsolicited email. Instead, you know, type in the web, web address that you know. Don't use uh, obvious passwords, um, your mother's maiden name. Everybody knows that people usually use their mother's maiden name, and people probably will know your mother's maiden name, so it's not a good idea. Um, you know, to use, to use that as a password. The last four digits of your social security number is not a good idea either. Those are all, um, those are both like obvious passwords. You should keep your personal information in a secure place at home, um, especially if you have um, other people coming into your home, um, like employees, um, or if you have roommates or other people that live with you, or if you have a contractor there doing work at your house. 
You should always shred paperwork um, with personal information and um, before before you. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's my last point for this one. Um, so another step or other steps that clients can take, um, and I think one of the best things that clients can do to avoid identity theft is to monitor accounts um, often and, you know, check the mail. I mentioned this earlier, check your mail for statements or accounts for credit cards that you didn't open um, and make sure that statements that you're receiving in the mail are actually, or I guess in your email as well, um, these are statements that you're actually expecting. So if you see something that, you know, doesn't look like it belongs or a card that you don't have that's, you know, a, a sign that you may have been a victim of identity theft. Um, it's also critical for your clients to continuously monitor their credit reports. One of the most important steps someone can take is to protect themselves, um, to protect themselves is to monitor their credit report to make sure there are no signs of identity theft, like unauthorized accounts opening your name, new addresses on your report. Uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, or the FCRA, requires that each of the nationwide credit reporting it, it, uh, companies, which are Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, TransUnion um, that they provide you with a free copy of your credit report um, at your request once every 12 months. And now, due to the pandemic, you can check your credit report every week um, for free through April 2021 at annualcreditreport.com. So yeah, if you check your reports often, uh, this can help you spot any new uh, fraud quickly. Your clients can also help avoid identity theft by following some basic tips to protect their files and devices, such as keeping NI software up to date. Um, it's not enough just to have the virus software in your computer, but you should regularly update the virus um, it, um, up, update this software to make sure it's uh, checking for viruses um, on your computer and all your other devices as well. You, as I mentioned before, you should use a difficult to guess passwords uh, with numbers, letters, uppercase and lowercase, and look for indications that, um, that online shop, shopping sites are secure. So a couple of years ago, um, new laws were put in place um, that were designed to help your clients avoid identity theft. Um, for example, fraud alerts, which I'll discuss more on the next slide, um, now last for one year instead of 90 days, and credit freezes are free for everyone, including children under 16 and incapacitated adults. Finally, active duty military um, personnel have access to free credit monitoring and credit monitoring services can alert your clients to mistakes or problems with their credit reports that might um, stem from unauthorized use of their personal information. The active duty alert uh, gives military personnel added benefits. Um, the credit reporting agencies will take their names off of marketing lists and pre-screen credit card offers for two years. And, uh, here are some other options to consider if your client or you yourself become a victim of identity theft or if you just want to be proactive to avoid identity theft, um, you should consider a, a fraud alert or a credit freeze. Um, which of these options you ultimately decide upon um, depends on your circumstance. Um, a fraud alert tells businesses that you're, uh, that, you know, to check your credit, they have to sign, uh, check in with you before they can open a new uh, account. And since uh, 2018, I guess the fall of 2018, when you place a fraud alert, it will last a year instead of 90 days. And fraud alerts are free and identi identify, um, and if you are identity theft uh, victim, you can get that extended for uh, seven years instead of one year, one year as it lists here on the uh, slide. So you'll have to, in order to place a fraud alert or a credit freeze, you'll have to contact the credit bureaus. So um, here's the contact information for all three nationwide credit reporting agencies, both the website and the phone number. If you request a freeze online or by phone, the agency must place the freeze within one business day. If you request um, a lift of the freeze, the agency must lift it within one hour. 
if you make your request by mail, um, the agency must place a list, um, must place or list a freeze within three business days um, after it gets your request. You can also list a freeze temporarily without a fee. So young people now have more protection from identity theft and fraud uh, thanks to that same uh, law uh, that was enacted two years ago. Um, the law lets parents and child welfare representatives of uh, people under 16, as well as legal guardians, request a uh, credit freeze on their behalf. Taking this step can help protect uh, a young person from identity theft and fraud, and it's free. So um, I think I mentioned earlier, um, there are multiple forms of identity theft, but I'll just go over a few of those um, here today. So tax identity theft is, is one of the major forms of identity theft. And it's when someone files a fraudulent tax return using your social security number. And the reason why uh, they're doing that is just to get a refund. So basically to claim your tax refund for themselves. And to do this, all they need is your social security number, which you can buy in the black market. Um, and then they can file for a refund. And so you don't really find out about it until you try to find out, try to file to get your own tax refund, and then the IRS gives you a notification saying that there's a duplicate filing. So tax identity theft is essentially a tax refund fraud. But this slide also lists a few other types of identity theft um, that are included under the, the umbrella of tax identity theft, which includes when someone claims your children as dependents or when someone claims a refund using a deceased taxpayer's information, um, it can also include when someone earns wages under your social security number, and then when you file a tax return listing wages, um, you actually earn the IRS asks, you know, why you can pay for these other taxes um, for the wages they have under your social security number. And so to reduce your risk of tax identity theft, it's important to follow some good filing practices. For example, you should know your tax preparer and file your returns um, as early as possible. And when it comes to actually sending your returns to the state um, or the IRS, don't put them in the actual like, outgoing mail. You should uh, go directly to the post office instead. And if you file them electronically, make sure you use a secure network. And finally, you should um, securely store any of your tax returns and shred any drafts. So as I mentioned this earlier when I showed uh, the graph of the different types of identity theft and the trends that we've seen this year in 2020 at the FTC. Since the start of the pandemic, we've been hearing about widespread fraud where imposters have been filing claims for unemployment benefits using the names and personal information of people who have not yet filed claims. The fraud had hit a number of states. Um, it's being investigated by several federal law enforcement agencies as well as state agencies. And I'll talk a little bit about um, more later about how to report this type of identity theft, uh, identity theft to the FTC, but we're advising people to report the fraud immediately to their state unemployment benefits office, um, employer, and local police. And now, again, that there's news that um, unemployment benefits might be extended, um, I'm sure that this kind of identity theft will, will continue into the new year. So children can also be victims of identity theft. Um, minors typically don't have credit reports, which means that if a young person um, um, might not find out about issues with their credit reports until they try to get credit themselves, um, you know, probably years later. And so here are some, on this slide, here are some warning signs for children um, that they've been victims of identity theft or they might be, become victims of identity theft. You know, if they, chart, if they start receiving credit card off offers, um, and I also want to highlight the possibility of a breach at school or within the, your uh, child's school district, especially now because so many children are learning virtually due to the pandemic. Um, familiar identity theft is another form of identity theft. It's, um, it's just when families steal the child's identity, and it's a lot of times it's harder to correct. Um, it, there's a lot of issues surrounding that with a family member, you know, usually the person that 
would help a child recover from identity theft if they had become a victim, but in this case, it could be the family member who actually was the perpetrator. Um, also, sometimes you have to take into consideration that the identity theft, uh, stopping the identity theft might cause greater harm if there's poverty-related poverty issues in the home. Um, and then, you know, especially assuming that the child is old enough to even realize what's going on, um, you know, that child might not be able or may not want to file a police report against you know, um, his or her uh, mom or dad. Also, um, children who are in foster care are more susceptible to identity theft, and it's harder to remedy um, um, for a number of reasons. So because of that, um, this fact, the Child and Family Services in, and Improvement and Innovation Act of 2011 provides that child welfare agencies must determine whether foster children, you know, those 16 and older, have a credit file, and also requires child welfare agencies to resolve any inaccuracies in the credit reports. And this obligation continues until the child is emancipated from um, foster care. So if your client has a young person in their life, there may be some ways to correct the errors in the report. Um, if the child is over um, the age of 18 when the debt is incurred, then he or she can use the FCRA or the, the Fair Credit Reporting Act um, remedies for adult identity, identity theft victims. If the child is under 18, then they, they need to show that they were a minor and therefore had no capacity to, um, to enter into a contract. Um, you can report child identity theft and get recovery steps on identitytheft.gov. So what happens in the event that you or one of your clients becomes a victim of identity theft? Um, then I've been talking about this website for uh, quite some time now. Um, we encourage you to visit identitytheft.gov, which is the federal government's one-stop resource for identity theft victims to both report um, and recover from identity theft. And I'll walk you through what uh, that looks like. So we've added new graphics here um, for additional recovery steps to identitytheft.gov. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, um, it says um, unemployment, unemployment benefits identity theft. Click here to report. And um, you know we added that that this year because of all the new reports that we had. Um, related to the pandemic that I discussed earlier. And so you'll also see in the upper right-hand corner above that flag for unemployment benefits identity theft that the website and the resources contained um, within, within it are both in English and in Spanish. So once you click on the Get Started button, um, you'll get you, on the home page, then you'll next have to pick a statement that best describes your situation. And you'll see here that there's now a statement that reflects the economic stimulus payment that consumers received due to the pandemic. And like I mentioned, I think there's reports that there may be another um, round of payments coming. So, um, you know, this option is still remains on identitytheft.gov. So, as, so once you um, so as you select which one best describes your situation, um, you know, as an added convenience, if you happen to pick, you know, uh, if there's a tax if, a tax identity theft, um, you can now report both your tax identity theft to the FTC and the IRS at the same time through this website. Um, and I will walk you through how to do that. But this screen, this is a quick screen that you'll see if you type in identitytheft.gov in your computer, and then after you click uh, get started, you will get to the next screen. And so these are just, you know, um, you know, you create an account, and it really literally walks you through the step-by-step -step, uh, process of, of reporting your identity theft and. and having tips uh, to recover from the theft. 
Here's an example of identity theft reports. And um, identitytheft.gov will pre-populate this form. It will also pre-populate the FTC identity theft report based on all the information you input on the previous screens. So everything will be set up for you and you'll actually be able just to send the IRS affidavit uh, directly to the IRS. Um, we, and it makes the process really easy for consumers. The IRS actually just updated this form a couple of weeks ago. So I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but it says December 2020 in the upper left-hand corner. This is an example of a simple personal recovery plan for someone who has uh, reported identity theft involving their bank account. When you click on the arrow at the end of each step of the plan, the site will um, provide detailed advice about how to carry out the next step. Um, for example, here the system advises you know, place a fraud alert on um, your credit reports. And when the person clicks on the arrow at the end of the line, they'll get links to each of the three credit bureaus. The system will also explain that a fraud alert is free and will make it harder for someone to open a new account um, in the person's name. You know, also tell the person to keep an eye out and make certain that they get a letter from each of the credit bureaus um, confirming that they have placed a fraud alert on the person's file. And so for each recovery step, the system is going to provide follow-ups and reminders. So for example, um, here it's a reminder uh, to send a follow-up letter to um, Bank of America. And you can see that the step that the system already created the follow-up letter and just pre-filled with the information the person has already provided. So all the person has to do is to review the letter, print it out, and, and mail it. And so the system also creates letters for people uh, to send to the credit reporting agencies, debt collectors, merchants, um, and others to resolve the theft. And um, here's just an example of a follow-up letter to a lender where a fraudulent account was open in the victim's name. And you'll see in the um, upper right-hand corner, the letter has identitytheft.gov logo um, showing the person has, an ident has reported the identity theft to the FTC. And then in the lower uh, left-hand corner, the letter lists enclosures that the person will need to send to speed the resolution um, of their claim. And so this is just another example of how the system automatically creates some um, Um, pre-filled letters that you can send to the credit bureaus and businesses. And it's pretty simple that, you know, you just need to print the letter, sign them, and mail them. So finally, um, there are, you know, a number of, so identitytheft.gov is like the best tool, I think, that we have at the FTC, but we have more tools. Um, you know, you can encourage your, your clients to visit consumer.gov. It's the FTC's website for consumer information. Um, it provides uh, some consumer protection basics. It's um, really simple and easy to follow. And there you can learn more information about getting and checking your credit report. And there are also tips and information about scams and identity theft. Also, we have a number of, of free publications, um, several on identity theft, including child identity theft. And there's also one on the related topic of data breaches. And if you don't want them in print form, um, or if you're not seeing your clients in person to give them these documents, um, you can download them on PDF. Um, so with that, um, I'll pass it to Lisa Schiffley, who will talk about coronavirus scams, um, older adults, and financial protection. Thank you so much um, for that wonderful presentation, Shamika, very informative and, and lots of good information. I wanted to let you know that um, we got six questions related to your presentation, and I've just put them up in the chat um, so you can um, – hopefully review them and then, you know, be ready to follow up when uh, when Lisa's done with her presentation. Does that sound good? Yes, that sounds good. Okay. Thank you again. We'll look forward to having you back to the questions in a few minutes. Uh, okay. And next we're going to hear from Lisa Schifferly on the coronavirus scams, and she's going to specifically talk about some that are related to older adults as well as things that we all need to be careful for. Lisa, are you all set? 
Yes, thanks so much, Heather, and thanks, Shamika, for that great presentation about identity theft. I'm going to focus on the coronavirus-related scams and talk about how to help people who are dealing with the financial impact of the pandemic. So I'm going to share a little bit about what we're doing at the national level, which hopefully will make your jobs easier as financial professionals. Uh, Heather already mentioned consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus is our central hub with resources for consumers to help them manage their finances during the pandemic. It's available in a variety of different languages and it covers topics like credit and debt management, student loan repayment, mortgage relief options, scams, online and mobile banking tips, and more. We also have a unified housing website that we've done with these other federal government agencies listed here. And this is one that is used for people who may be behind in their mortgage or behind on their rent to learn about the options that are available to them. And I'm going to discuss some of those options in a minute. But this site you can find at consumerfinance.gov slash housing. It's a really great resource for anyone who is dealing with the financial impact of the pandemic as it relates to their housing. Now I'm going to start by talking about some coronavirus related scams, focusing on healthcare scams, which is one of the big categories that we're seeing. Uh, at first, we were looking at fake vaccine scams. Now, thankfully, there are real vaccines that are available, uh, but scammers have now shifted so that they are taking advantage of this. So now we're warning people to be on the lookout for scammers who may call to lure you in with promises of early access to vaccines. And please to remind clients and the people that you're working with not to pay for promises of early access to the vaccines and not to give personal information over the phone like social security numbers, bank or credit card numbers in order to get a vaccine. Uh, you should not have to do that. There also are scams related to test kits, uh, fake cures or treatments, including air filter systems that people say will filter coronavirus out of your home. Um, those are scams as well, so we are warning people, as, as is the FTC, that if you get a phone call, email, or text message claiming to sell one of these items, that it is a scam. Another big area are the government imposter scams. People who are on Medicare may get calls claiming to get special access to testing or treatments because of Medicare, but that's a scam. Medicare is not offering that kind of special access at this time. On the right-hand side, you'll see contact tracing call infographic. This is actually from the FTC and warns people uh, similarly that contact tracers may call you, but scammers may also call you pretending to be contact tracers and ask for personal information. So people should know the real contact tracers are not going to ask for money. They're not going to ask for Social Security number, bank, or credit card numbers. Another scam to look out for um, both in relation to the coronavirus and also at holiday times are charity-related scams. Uh, we warn people not to pay by cash, gift card, or money transfer to someone who calls claiming to be from a charity. Those are methods of scammers because they know that it's hard for you to get your money back if you pay that way. Uh, we encourage people instead to visit the organization's website directly or ask the charity or supposed charity to send something in the mail because legitimate charities will do that in the mail. Another one I want to talk about, another type of scam that we're seeing, and this one specifically especially affects older adults, but also people who may be confined to their homes during the pandemic, is what we call the errand helper scam. And that's when scammers offer to help you with your errands. Um, they say they'll buy groceries or do other errands for you, but then they run off with the money and do not get the things that they said they were going to get. So we're reminding people who are working with older adults um, to encourage them to find a trusted friend or neighbor to do those errands. If they don't have one, the elder care locator at eldercare.acl.gov or 800-677-1116 is a good way to uh, try to find reputable help during the pandemic and also at other times. Uh, the bottom line for any of these types of imposter scams is that if anyone calls you asking for your social security number, bank account number, credit card, Medicare number, or other personal information like that, do not give it out over the phone. 
if someone's calling you out of the blue asking for that information. Also, to be very wary of anyone who calls asking for you to pay by gift card, wire transfer, or one of these peer-to-peer -peer apps, um, because again, those can be harder to get your money back. I do want to point out some resources that the CFPB has specifically for older adults and people working with older adults. We have a series of blogs on coronavirus resources, including tips for financial caregivers. If you're unable to be with someone whose money you help manage, um, then it offers tips about using video, chat, or phone, as well as consulting our guides on managing someone else's money. We also have online and mobile banking tips for older adults who may be getting into online banking for the first time during the pandemic. And then we have information on planning for an uncertain future to make sure that uh, both parties in a relationship know what's going on with the finances so that if something happens to one of them, the other one is able to take over and carry on. I'm going to talk more about uh, protections for renters during the pandemic in a minute. Um, so I'll save that for a later slide in the interest of time. But we also have information about considering early retirement withdrawals and the CARES Act protections, which eliminate that early withdrawal penalty. Finally, and not on the slide, but very important, just today we released a new blog about reverse mortgage scams, which can happen when a caregiver coerces an elderly elderly homeowner into applying for a reverse mortgage loan, or maybe somebody impersonates the elderly relative and basically commits ID theft during the loan process, um, or use the older homeowner's social security number or other personal information to apply for a reverse mortgage loan. So that blog has tips about how to avoid those types of scams, um, in, including making sure that you don't get a reverse mortgage just because a contractor says it's the best way to pay for home improvements. That was a big issue that I saw as a legal services attorney. So again, reverse mortgage scams are another one to keep an eye out for during the pandemic. Now that I've covered some of the basic scams that we're seeing during the pandemic, I also want to talk about how to help people who are dealing with the financial impact of the pandemic. And for people having trouble paying bills, which is a lot of people right now, there are a number of options, but it's really important to make sure that they know to contact their lenders, loan servicers, and other creditors and talk to them to work something out, um, to not just, you know, think that it's going to be taken care of because it's pandemic related or just, you know, hide the head in the sand because you're worried about it. Uh, it's very important to actually contact the lenders. Many credit card companies and lenders are offering options to help, like waiving ATM fees, overdraft fees, late fees, allowing people to delay, adjust, or skip payments. Uh, this slide shows some of the items that people should be prepared to explain when they are requesting a modification to their payment schedule, like what their employment situation is, how much they can pay, when they can start those payments, and that they are experiencing a hardship related to COVID. Now, the CFPB has a special focus on the mortgage relief options and a lot of the options that are available to homeowners and renters. Again, you can find that information on the housing hub at consumerfinance.gov slash housing. Uh, this slide shows a really helpful video that we have explaining mortgage forbearance, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but before I get into all the mortgage-related protections, I do want to take a moment to mention for renters that there are protections as well. First, it's important to check with the state and local government, check with the state attorney general, because many states have issued eviction bans during the pandemic, and also check with local legal services. Um, second, the CDC, you've probably heard, has an eviction moratorium until December 31st of this year, um, and renters have to present a CDC form saying that they're behind on their rent due to the pandemic. It has certain income restrictions, like you have to make less than 99000 or 198000 for joint filers. Um, so there's that restriction. Hopefully that will be extended beyond December 31st, but right now it is till December 31st. So beyond that, um, renters should look for action from Congress on CARES Act extensions. As Shamika mentioned, there's a pending 
$900 billion package, which would extend foreclosure and eviction moratoriums until January 31st. It would also provide $25 billion in rental assistance, add an additional 16 weeks of unemployment benefits, and extend student loan forbearance until April 1st. So we'll all be keeping our eyes out um, for what happens with that. But in the meantime, the existing protections under the CARES Act are two for mortgage holders. The first is there's a foreclosure moratorium, um, and FH, FHFA on its own has extended that until at least January 31st of next year. So that means lenders and servicers cannot begin a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure against you if you are in a home with a federally backed mortgage that FHFA provides. The second thing that people have is a mortgage forbearance option where they can request a forbearance of 180 days and then extend it for another 180 days. Um, you all as financial educators are probably familiar with forbearance. If not, I uh, would encourage you and your clients to check out this forbearance video at consumerfinance.gov slash housing. But basically the forbearance is when the mortgage servicer or lender allows you to temporarily pay your mortgage at a lower rate or pause paying your mortgage. Um, in the case of the forbearance for COVID, uh, there is no documentation of hardship that is required. So a lot of people ask that, whether they're gonna have to prove that it's COVID related uh, issue that they're behind on the mortgage. You don't have to prove it. You do have to assert it, though. Um, it's not going to happen automatically. So people do have to know to contact their mortgage servicer. Again, these are for federally backed loans. So it's important to first figure out who your mortgage servicer is. And if they're federally backed, then these things apply. If they're not federally backed, still do uh, contact the mortgage servicer because many of them are offering similar types of protections. Um, now, I do want to also talk about dealing with debt because a lot of people are dealing with debt in addition to housing-related issues during the pandemic. And it's important that people know their rights under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, and first, that they also know to contact the people they owe money to to try to work something out. Um, but under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, they're not allowed to be harassed by the debt collectors. Um, the debt collectors can't call them at all hours or curse at them or threaten them. Um, so there are protections under federal law to protect um, people from harassing debt collectors. Also important to note um, to beware of debt settlement companies and to use reputable um, people if you are trying to work out your debts and to consult with credit counselors about that. Um, lastly, I just want to mention about protecting your credit during the coronavirus pandemic. As Shamika mentioned, due to COVID until April 2021, anyone can get free weekly credit reports at annualcreditreport.com. We do encourage people to do that, not only to check for identity theft, but also because when you do um, make that forbearance agreement or any other sort of agreement with a lender, uh, the furnisher is supposed to then report that to the credit reporting company so that there is an indicator on your credit report uh, that there is an agreement in place that's COVID related. And if you are not behind on your payment schedule before then, then it should appear as a current with a note that there's a COVID-related forbearance. So it's very important to check that the CRAs are actually um, making those flags on your credit report by checking your credit regularly. And if they're not, you can file a complaint with the CFPB. And I will show you contact information for that on this slide, which is consumerfinance.gov flash complaint, usually at the CFPB, we can get your response within 15 days uh, in terms of getting a response to any complaint filed with us. And it would be good to file complaints if you have any issues with the credit reporting companies or with lenders related to this coronavirus related uh, relief under the CARES Act or otherwise. And again, for additional information about where to get help, uh, please do consult consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus. 
And with that, I will turn it back to Heather so that we can have some time to take your questions. Thank you, Lisa. That was really helpful and very interesting. And um, I, I see that you have one question in the chat um, from Randy, and it's about SBA loans and some issues he's seen around that. So you might want to review that. And also, um, I had a question that I wanted to throw out that I hear a lot, um, which is what happens to um, the mortgage payments that um, were in forbearance? Are they tagged on at the end? Um, some people feel like they're do all at once at the end, and then some people feel like they don't have to pay them. So I thought maybe if you uh, would like to, you could comment on that. Um, yes. Yeah, so, okay. Oh. So, so I thought we'd jump back and have um, Shamika answer her questions, and that'll give you some time, and then we'll get, we'll get after hers are done, we'll get to you. Does that sound good? Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Shamika, it's, you're up now if you're ready to answer the questions you have. Sure. So um, you want me to answer them, not in the chat, but um, right now over the over the phone, right? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so I'll try to go back. So someone asked a question about whether you can um, place a fraud alert and a credit freeze at the same time. You have to uh, you have to choose one. I will drop a link in the chat of a, a blog post from the FTC that like you know that shows you the difference between the two and, and explains it more. But you can choose one. Um, the next question is, uh, do you know where a person can get the credit report request form and report in Spanish? And so um, I'm assuming the person means um, the credit report from the annual, annualcreditreport.com. Um, you can just go there and there's a co you can contact them and ask for an accommodation um, to see if they've provided uh, the information in Spanish and English. If you're reporting identity theft, of course, the FTC, that is available in Spanish. You just click on the the button in the top right-hand corner will be in Spanish for you. Um, with respect to the pamphlets on child identity theft or any of the pamphlets that we have, you can go to ftc.gov slash bulk order, and I'll write, I can write this in the chat too, and that's where you can either order these pamphlets or you can download them in PDF, and it's free. Uh, then there's another question about um, a social security number, uh, a child's, uh, a friend's uh, child uh, had a social security number taken. My advice would be, you know, to report that in uh, identity.gov as soon as possible. Um, generally speaking, it can take a long time to clear your credit report. So even if it is a child, um, you know, you want to make sure things are rectified by the time that child is an adult or gets a driver's license and needs a car or going to college. And so I would not Take, take that lightly. Um, any kind of identity theft that you see or you know of that's happened to a child, I, I would report it immediately. I, I think those are all of the questions. Let me scroll up to make sure I didn't miss anything. Yes, I think you got them all, Shamika. Thank you. Okay. It's, so is it okay for me to put in the, in the uh, chat box the link to the blog post that has a, really, a good article about how to tell the difference between the two? Actually, Lisa wrote it. Absolutely. Any resources like that are helpful. Thank you. Okay. I'll do that now. Great. And Lisa, this is Heather. Do you, um, are you ready to answer your question? Sure. There was one question about phony SBA loan applications and what to do about uh, people fi filing phony applications for SBA disaster loans and the person says they aren't um, getting information back from the SBA about um, what happened. Um, it sounds like there could be some uh, business compromise and business-related identity theft. So I would encourage you both to report it to the FTC through identitytheft.gov and also to the CFPB at consumerfinance.gov slash complaint. Um, you can also find more information about what to do about disaster-related loans and those PPP loans um, at consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus. Now, someone else asked about forbearance, and that's a really good question about what happens to the money in the forbearance. It is important to advise people that it doesn't erase what they owe. They don't um, uh, get forgiven that money forever. They just don't have to pay it for a certain period of time. 
Uh, usually it's put at the end of the loan, and for the COVID-related forbearance, it's supposed to be put at the end of the loan in equal installments. It's important if you're advising someone to make sure that they do not um, end up with a forbearance where there's a huge lump sum payment at the end of the loan that they're not going to be able to make um, rather than it's better to have it spread out over, you know, a regular payment over months because if they get a huge lump sum, then they may end up in foreclosure when that lump sum becomes due. So that's a great question and good thing to keep an eye on. And again, I would direct people to that housing website, um, consumerfinance.gov slash housing in order to get more information. There are like four different videos about forbearances and things to keep in mind there. Thank you, uh, Lisa. I appreciate that. We also just got another question that was sent in. Um, I think somebody said uh, that the page says not found on the bulk orders. I think they're speaking of the bulk orders for the FTC. Um, so maybe uh, if that's correct, uh, maybe we could put up the bulk order location for that, or maybe it's for the one that I put up. I'm not sure which. Let me check that. I'll check both links. I'll tell you what. Whoever you wrote that. At the end? Is it? I'm sorry? You can also try bulkorder.ftc.gov. Sometimes I guess do it better. Yeah, and I think there's no S at the end of it. It says ftc.gov slash bulk orders. It's just bulk order. Okay. Thank you for that. I typed it wrong. I apologize. I didn't. Uh, so just take the S off, um, and it should work for you. Let me see if there's any other questions that have popped up. Um, if not, we'll wrap up. I don't see any more. Tracy, do you see any additional questions? Hi, Heather. I'm just taking a look um, right now. And now I do not see any further questions. Okay, wonderful. Well, again, I would like to thank our speakers today for this wonderful information. Um, we'll make sure everybody that's logged in gets a copy of the slides. And if, you, if you're just on the phone, if you write that CFPB, Cenex at CFPB.gov, which is the one, two, third, third link on this slide, and ask for the slides, we can provide those. Um, if anybody on this call does not get the announcements directly to their mailbox for these webinars and would like to, they can also write that mailbox and ask to be put on the mailing list. Um, thank you, uh, for Marion, for your kind words about the meeting. And I'd also like to thank Tracy Wade um, for being our technician and, and event manager for this event, and also um, people on her team, Isabel Bailey and, um, sorry, uh, Susan Funk. Thank the three of you for being here to support the to, to support this webinar. Uh, let's see, we have a question. What is the email to ask and get on the list? It's um, on. I don't know if you can see the slide, but in case you can, it's the third. It's the third link um, on this slide. CFPB underscore Cenex F I N E X at CFPB dot gov. I'll stick it in the chat as well. Uh, it looks like um, that is everything, um, so I think we're ready to sign off now. So thank everyone for attending. It looks like we had a great, at a peak, about 413 attendees, and uh, we won't be having a session um, in January, but we will be having um, at least one webinar in February, which I will let you know more about closer to that date. So I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday. Um, there's lots of kudos to you, Lisa and Shamika, for the great presentation, and I concur with that. And everybody take care and stay safe, and I look forward to connecting with all of you in the new year. Take care. Bye-bye.